Somebody's going to be up here besides me. <laughs> Can we find Sandy? Welcome to the Center for Cuban Studies. You're sitting in our Cuban art space. I'm Sandra Levinson. We put together a new exhibit in honor of Jane's wonderful book. <laughs> You might notice that every poster behind us has to do with the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961. For those of you who don't know, the Bay of Pigs is called Hiron in Cuba because the Bay of Pigs is bounded by Hiron Beach. And in Cuba, they call the Bay of Pigs after their beach, and we call it after their bay. When Juan Tamargo and Bernardo Navarro started looking for posters to put up, which had to do with U.S.-Cuba relations over these years, we were amazed at how many had to do with the Bay of Pigs invasion. And it seems appropriate, Jane, that these are behind you as yes. we speak. very nice, very nice. <laughs> Jane and I go back a long way because she was there at the beginning of the Center for Cuban Studies. We co-edited our magazine called Cuba Update, which I think we're both still very proud of. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was while she was at the center that Jane first prepared a chronology of U.S.-Cuba relations. Right. <laughs> and I couldn't be more pleased to be here to help all of you get this marvelous book. I'm really sad, though, that this book is coming out at the time that Jane and Bruce are moving from the New York area, i.e. Montclair, to the Bay Area. Yes. Now it's okay, we have a lot of friends out there, a lot of members, they have their kids, but it means you'll be very far away from us, Jane, you'll and we don't like that. that. Yes, well, I, I go there occasionally, and now you'll be added to my list, but right. um, it's kind of sad. I have a lot of questions to ask Jane, um, about the book and about U.S.-Cuba relations, but first I want her to be able to say what she wants to say about this book. I think it's wonderful, and we're very grateful to Monthly Review for publishing this book at this time. I just got back from two trips to Cuba, the first with 14 members of my family, <laughs> because when my sister in Minneapolis was asked, where she wanted to celebrate, what restaurant she wanted to celebrate her 90th birthday in, she said, Cuba. <laughs> and everybody said, well, wait a minute, we don't know a restaurant named Cuba. She said, I mean, I want to go back to Cuba. We had a family trip there three years ago. And thanks to Mara Sewell, we actually managed. It was a long, hard struggle, but Thank you, Bob, and thank everyone at Mara Sewell for actually managing to arrange that the 14 members of my family were in Cuba for two weeks, and at the same time as Obama, and we all went to the Rolling Stones concert. <laughs> <laughs> we were 14 of the 500,000 people who were there. Yes, my sister was there dancing. Mm -hmm. yep, amazing. Um, and. You know, many of us in this room have lived through too many difficult years of U.S.-Cuba relations. And my guess is that we have a few more difficult years ahead of us, too. Um, one of the things that people keep asking is, well, what's going to happen now? That's what everyone asks. And I'm sure Jane will talk about that, and we'll all talk about it, you know. Um, last week I was in... When I was in Cuba, we went to see my old friend Pepe Vieira, who was the first person who ever got me to Cuba. He was at the Cuban Mission to the United Nations, and because of him, I got an invitation. Some of you may remember that the only way to go legally at that time was to be invited by the Cuban government. And of course, respectable people didn't want to be invited by the Cuban <laughs> government. <laughs> people who didn't care about their reputations like me <laughs> gratefully accepted an invitation by the Cuban government. 
And I still take every group that I possibly can to see Pepe because he's so smart. And what we talked about is, you know, what happens now? Um, now that the revolutionary generation is either dying or retiring and a new generation will come into power and as Pepe said they won't have the moral authority of a Fidel or a Raul. They'll have to depend on economic success and the usual um, barometers of success. So I'm very grateful for you being here, Jane. I feel a little bit sad that you're leaving. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that one of your um, last presentations will be here right. where we started together. Thank you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you, Sam. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to be here tonight for the very reasons that Sander just, just presented that this was where I began the chronology chronicling Cuba-US relations for the magazine and Sandra was the one who urged me to write a, a book link chronology and, which I did and, and she has supported and encouraged me all these years and for that I shall always be deeply grateful and I also want to thank uh, Martin Padillo and Susie Day, who are, there they are back there, who are here from Monthly Review Press, which is publishing this book at the most timely time, as Sandra pointed out, when President Obama is urging people to leave this history behind. This is supposed to be left behind. And it's a time when we need this history the most, because as Sandy indicated that the challenging time is ahead now. The real ideological challenge is coming. And we will see what happens. I don't have any predictions, but uh, we can use history to see patterns and we can figure out where the dots connect. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do something about this throat. Um, rather than leave it behind, the final chapter of Cuba and the U.S. Empire brings hundreds of years of history into the 21st century with a jolt, a warning from the great liberator, Simon Bolivar, three centuries ago that the United States appears destined by providence to plague America with miseries in the name of freedom. As he made this analysis in 1829, Bolivar knew about the goals described in Thomas Jefferson's letters to President Madison and then to President Monroe. And I'll just read uh, that from the book, the only um, thing I'm going to read from the book, the others I'll read from having printed them out from the book. Um, former President Jefferson in 1809 writes to President James Madison that with Cuba and Canada we should have such an empire for liberty as she has never surveyed since the creation. An empire for liberty. Those are the miseries in the name of freedom right there. An empire for liberty. And then he wrote to James Monroe, I candidly confess that I have ever looked on Cuba as the most interesting addition which could ever be made to our system of states. So Jefferson's goal of exceptional liberty uh, in an empire persists into the 21st century. Just two years ago, President Obama told cadets at West Point, I believe in American exceptionalism with every fiber of my being. While extolling the exceptional empire, Obama was secretly engaged in changing its policy toward Cuba, leading to the most important Cuba-US news of this century, the announcement of December 17, 2014, that promised diplomatic relations between Washington and Havana, 
along with the liberation on that very day of the three Cuban heroes who were still in prison as they joined the two heroes who were already at home in Cuba. What an ecstatic moment that was for all the people around the world who had worked to get them freed. A long battle finally won. The other battle for normalization of relations is far from being won, but at least it's on the table. And I am looking forward to explaining tonight how the chronological method answers the question of why now? Why did the president change his mind? But first I want to explain why I find the chronological method a revelatory and thrilling way of learning from history. Reports continue years later to place a lot of attention on major events like the Bay of Pigs invasion and the October crisis or missile crisis, but a close study of the chronology of those episodes connects the dots in surprising directions. Can everybody hear me back there? Good, great. For instance, for more than half a century, the travel ban and the trade ban have been two major weapons in the war waged against Cuba. Why were these policies implemented? On January 16, 1961, the U.S. State Department proclaimed that citizens traveling to Cuba must obtain passports specifically endorsed by the State Department for that destination. Why did President Eisenhower choose to violate our constitutional right to travel at that particular time? Connecting the dots as we look at the chronology of early 1961, we realized that the White House wanted U.S. citizens out of Cuba before the secret invasion took place three months later. The travel ban thus originated as part of a secret plan for the Bay of Pigs invasion. On February 7, 1962, the next year, a U.S. embargo, bloqueo, on all trade with Cuba except for non-subsidized sale of food and medicines went into effect. Why did President Kennedy choose to implement this major policy at that time? Once again, a secret plan to invade Cuba created this major weapon which still persists today. These two weapons, the travel ban and the trade ban, were born because of secret plans to invade Cuba. But when those plans failed, as they both did, of course, the travel and trade bans continued to the present day. The chronology of the trade embargo is a story of secrecy and deliberate genocidal cruelty, beginning with the Eisenhower administration when the Cuban Revolution triumphed. Following the defeat, well, let me read um, something about that before I continue here. As deadly as it is, this is from the book, I've printed it out so I can read the print, bigger print. <laughs> covert, as deadly as it is, covert ter terrorism has not been as devastating to Cuba as the overt te terrorism of the U.S. trade embargo that has been aimed at starving the Cuban people into submission ever since the revolution. According to a 1959 State Department memorandum, Robert Kleberg, owner of the King Ranch in Texas, with a $3 million cattle investment in Cuba, told Secretary of State Christian Herter, excuse me, that depriving Cuba of its sugar quota privilege would cause, quote, widespread further unemployment and that, quote, large numbers of people thus forced out of work would begin to go hungry. That's all in quotes. Herder cautioned that such a policy would be economic warfare in peacetime. Which was it to be? And by the way, my husband and I were driving down to Mexico from Houston, Texas, where we were living at the time. My husband was serving um, in the Air Force at the time, and um, I was eight months pregnant. And we rode down to Mexico, and we passed, we kept passing, we kept passing, and we kept passing the King Ranch. 
It just goes on and on and on. It was like another country or something. So that's how big this guy was and why he had such influence in Washington. Which was it to be, warfare or peacetime? Within a year, the Eisenhower administration instituted economic warfare as permanent policy toward Cuba. In the United States, people hear that it is Cuba's economic system, not the trade embargo that hurts the Cuban people. Yet, the genesis of the trade embargo was explicitly to starve Cubans into submission. In April 1960, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Lester Mallory, sent a decisive secret memo to another Assistant Secretary of State, he was in the State Department, for Inter-American Affairs, admitting that the majority of Cubans, in quotes, support Fidel Castro, and thus the, quote, only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Therefore, quote, it follows that every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. Following the defeat of the Bay of Pigs invasion, right here behind us on the wall, a big backup, in April 1961, Operation Mongoose was created by the Kennedy administration in November, only seven months later. I'll read a shortened version of the very long entry in the book about the founding of Operation Mongoose. President Kennedy issues a memorandum to Secretary of State Dean Rusk and others who will be involved in his decision to launch top secret Operation Mongoose, quote, to help Cuba overthrow the communist regime. It reminds me of President Obama lately saying how much he wants to help the Cuban people. He doesn't say to overthrow the regime, but it's there, as if he were saying it. This leads to the creation of a new control group, the special group, to oversee mongoose, including practically everybody in the government, by the way, but I named some here, including National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, CIA Director John McCone, Head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Lyman Limnitzer, augmented by Attorney General Robert Kennedy and General Maxwell Taylor. President Kennedy puts General Edward Lansdell in charge of coordinating mongoose operations with those of the Departments of State and Defense. In other words, this General Lansdale was going to work very closely with both state and defense. Lansdale engineered the U.S. puppet government of South Vietnam in 1954, and President Kennedy was a great admirer of his exploits. William Harvey is put in charge of the CIA's Task Force W, the CIA unit that will take part in Mongoose. Task Force W will have about 400 people working at CIA headquarters in Washington and in the Miami CIA station. President Obama in Cuba just said that Miami serves as a model for what the Cuban people want to build. <coughs> now, as Fidel said, you could have a heart attack over these things, these sweetened words in that, um, that um, President Obama brought to to Havana. But um, anyway, during the coming months, Secretary of State Rusk and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara sometimes attend the meetings of the Mongoose Group. Richard Helms had replaced Richard Bissell as CIA Chief of Covert Operations, so of course he was involved. For an interesting story, follow Bissell in the book. Just go to Bissell in the index and read about him. It's fascinating. Other overseers included Richard Goodwin of the State Department and from the government press, Ed Murrow of the United States Information Agency. Um, then that was, that was on November 30th. On January 18th of the next year, 1962, 
in a top secret report partially declassified in 1989 addressed to President Kennedy and officials involved with Operation Mongoose, General Edward Lansdale describes plans to overthrow the Cuban government. The failure of the U.S. sponsored operation in April 1961, he wrote, so shook the faith of Cuban patriots. Now the Cuban patriots that Lansdale's talking about are the right-wing Cubans in Miami, not the Cuban patriots in Havana and Cuba. So shook the fate of those Cuban patriots in U.S. competence and intentions in supporting a revolt that a new effort to generate a revolt must have active support from the key Latin American countries. The preparation phase must result in a political action organization being in key localities inside Cuba with its own voice for psychological operations and its own action arm, small guerrilla bands, sabotage squads, etc. That's what Lansdale wanted to create inside Cuba and they've been trying this off and on ever since. The climactic moment of revolt will come from an angry reaction of the people to a government action sparked by an incident or from a fracturing of the leadership cadre within the regime or both. A major goal of the project must be to bring this about. The popular movement will capitalize on this climactic moment by initiating an open revolt. The United States, if possible, in concert with other Western Hemisphere nations, will then give open support. Such support will include military force as necessary. Lansdale lists various political, military, and economic policies that are subsequently implemented by the Department of State, Defense, and Commerce. So uh, things were moving right along and right away uh, immediately these policies took effect and by the end of January the OAS had suspended Cuba's membership in the in the Organization of American States. That's how fast they moved. It was a close vote but it was a win for General Lansdale and company. The full trade embargo followed on February 7th of 1962. <coughs> Inside the Mongoose secret plan the embargo was implemented. Lansdale's crusade continued and on February 20th he presents to the Mongoose group a 26 page top secret timetable for implementation of the overthrow of the Cuban government which is very interesting you, if you see what he's doing you can see why Cuba has to be very wary of all these steps that the United States makes because they never know whether they're part of something like this. CIA agents or pathfinders as he called them will be infiltrated to carry out sabotage and organization including radio broadcast. Jacqueline Kennedy would be especially effective in visiting children refugees in Miami. The OAS and NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the United Nations will be used for international support. Um, guerrilla operations will begin in August and September with defections of high officials to tell the inside story and quote, evoke world sympathy with the freedom fighters. World sympathy for freedom fighters. Finally, in the first two weeks of October, quote, open revolt and overthrow of the communist empire. So that's what they were aiming for when we had that crisis. But we knew about the crisis, but we did not know about Operation Mongoose. Um, Cuba, of course, found out right away about the secret plan. They have the best security system. I think it's the best in the world because they've managed to protect Fidel Castro and other Cuban leaders from hundreds, hundreds of assassination attempts and so on. They began to prepare defense, which included Soviet nuclear missiles, as we all know. And as we all know now, Operation Mongoose almost led to global catastrophe. 
but Operation Mongoose was classified as secret information until 1989, so U.S. citizens were not told of its existence. History was not just left behind, it was totally hidden. It's the kind of history we need to know and the kind of history that Obama wants to leave behind. <coughs> Although the nuclear confrontation was avoided, Mongoose's side effects continue. The trade embargo engineered by General Lansdale remains as the foremost obstacle to normalization of relations. So, the embargo or bloqueo has caused the deaths of thousands of Cubans. Cuba estimates that the economic cost to the island is $685 million every year. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates that the embargo cost to the United States economy is $1.2 billion every year in lost sales and exports. The Chamber of Commerce for a long time has been against this embargo. Another side effect of Operation Mongoose, the suspension of Cuba from the OAS, finally ended in the 2009 OAS summit. A chronological study of how and why it ended leads to an answer to the often asked question, why did President Obama change his mind about policy toward Cuba? I'll read now what the final chapter of Cuba and the U.S. Empire says about this history-making development because this is the study of chron chronological context at its best because this really does explain why he had to make that change. In the first decade of the new American century, which is what they call it, the peoples of the world witnessed the worldwide consequences of the U.S. ideology of exceptionalism, which implies that the United States, because it is exceptional, exceptional sorry, is the only nation that has the right to tell other nations what to do. People watched how President George W. Bush declared a war on terror that brought ongoing terror to country after country. We learned how the United States brought its freedom and democracy to the small portion of Cuba that it occupies, creating the infamous prison at Guantanamo Bay. We heard the notorious lie about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and we endure its persisting consequences. Latin America and the Caribbean experienced 21st century efforts backed by the United States to overturn elected governments with successful coups in Haiti and Honduras and of course the current ep efforts to um, end the regimes in Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador. The miseries in the name of freedom have continued some of the chickens had to come home to ro roost. <laughs> the OAS, headquartered in Washington, was a U.S. bastion in the Western Hemisphere. But in 2009, having grown in members as well as political power, it voted to end Cuba's suspension. President Obama made it clear that he would not attend the OAS Summit of the Americas in 2012. They have it every three years if President Raul Castro attended. Dismissing Cuba's elections, he told his press conference that all the leaders present at the summit were conferred the legitimacy of a country speaking through democratic channels, but he said that is not yet happening in Cuba. Since the Helms-Burton Act outlaws any Cuban election in which either Fidel Castro or Raul Castro runs for office, those would be illegal, Obviously, the election of Raul Castro in 2008 is not legitimate in Washington. Meanwhile, Latin American and Caribbean states were creating a different model for the hemisphere, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. CELAC was established in 2011 in Venezuela with the initiative of the late visionary Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. When the 21st century opened, 
OAS members included all 35 nations of the Western Hemisphere, with Cuba suspended. 11 years into the 21st century, CELAC consisted of all those OAS nations, including Cuba, with two exceptions, the United States and Canada are excluded. The members of CELAC wanted to become a zone of peace where nations would settle differences without war warring with one another, whereas the United States is engaged in the forever war, attacking or invading country after country. CELAC also wanted to remain a nuclear-free zone. Every member of CELAC long ago signed the Treaty of Plato Loco that bans production, use, or storage of nuclear arms in Latin America and the Caribbean whereas the United States maintains its nuclear arsenal and recently is modernizing it. At the 2012 OAS summit, the draft final declaration demanded an end to the U.S. trade embargo against Cuba and a decisive end to Cuba's expulsion. The United States and Canada vetoed. So that OAS summit ended without a final declaration. As an Associated Press headline put it, U.S.-Canada stand alone, insisting on the exclusion of Cuba from summits. Seeking to alienate Cuba, President Obama had alienated the United States. <laughs> At that time, Obama was running for re-election. In the heat of the presidential campaign, Obama and Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney ignored voices of dissent and predictably engaged in outdoing each other in their fervor for empire. Just as President Obama called for regime change in Cuba, Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney promised hardliners that we will hasten the day when the regime will come to an end. Speaking at the Air Force Academy commencement on, in May 2012, President Obama dutifully followed those neoconservatives from the Project for the New American Century with their strategy for a global Pax Americana. He told the graduating officers that the United States had been and will always be the one indispensable nation in world affairs because, he said, America is exceptional and the 21st century will be another great American century. Explaining these officers' duties in this new American century, he invoked American century seven times as he promised, quote, military superiority in all areas, air, land, sea, space, and cyber. The goal, he said, is an international order where the rights and responsibilities of all nations and peoples are upheld and where countries thrive by meeting their obligations and face consequences when they don't. So now who is to determine what consequences? Once he was re-elected re to the White House in 2012, Obama had to deal with the situation in the OAS where several countries planned to boycott the 2015 summit if Cuba were not president, present. Obama had to make a choice. He could refuse to attend and therefore be totally isolated in this hemisphere, or he could join in welcoming Cuba and be a statesman. All the while, CELAC was offering its model for hemispheric cooperative organization. This was the state of affairs when President Obama decided to take a different direction for U.S. relations with Cuba. The Obama administration began secret negotiations with Cuba in June 2013. Even so, in November of that year, at a fundraiser in the home of Jorge Mas Santos of the, new, of the Cuban American National Foundation, he was the new chairman following his father's chairmanship, and in the presence of a prominent so-called dissident from Cuba, President Obama stated that, quote, freedom in Cuba will come because of extraordinary activists and the incredible courage of folks like we see here today. But the United, but the United States can help, 
he said. <coughs> and we have to be creative and we have to continue to update our policies in the age of the internet. He assured his audience that, quote, the aims are always going to be the same. Even as the White House was engaged in secret negotiations with the Cuban government, the Obama administration was continuing its efforts for regime change. The U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, did not stop its co covert machinations after Alan Gross was arrested. USAID continued to fund various subversive activities such as Sunsuneo, aimed at enticing young people in Cuba to create smart mobs that would help overthrow the Cuban government. The subversive intercessional aims of those activities were exposed by the Associated Press in, in 2014 while secret negotiations were taking place. But the negotiations were successful in that President Obama and President Raul Castro <coughs> presented that history-making surprise on December 17, 2014. Overnight, the template shifted. The Obama administration was promoting sovereign equality. U.S.-Cuba relations moved into unexplored terrain. Both presidents attended the 2015 OAS summit last April, so at least one of Operations Mongoose's, Operation Mongoose's plots was finally ended with the entry of Cuba back into the OAS. Both presidents spoke about the importance of negotiating about differences. President Obama wasn't interested in dealing with the past, but President Castro consistently <coughs> emphasized that normalization of relations can be achieved only by the elimination of major obstacles, particularly the trade embargo, the occupation of Guantanamo, and the presence of Cuba on the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Cuba was removed from that list of state sponsors of terrorism soon after the summit, so that was a major victory. The new relationship with diplomatic embassies and negotiations presents opportunities for major improvements. President Obama visited Havana with what former President Fidel Castro calls sweetened words. I imagine Fidel was thinking of Bolivar's warning about miseries in the name of freedom. President Obama claims to want Congress to end the trade embargo, but during his administration, U.S. and foreign countries have been fined, companies rather, U.S. and foreign companies, have been fined over $14 billion. In February, even as Cuba was preparing, this past February, to welcome the president to Havana, the Treasury Department fined a French company for using spare parts and equipment of U.S. origin on vessels, vessels that were exploring for oil and gas in Cuban territorial waters. Why is this? Imperialism remains imperialism with its inescapable demands. The aims will always be the same. I am hoping that Cuba and the U.S. empire contributes to an understanding of the history that explains our present reality. Those of us who live in the belly of the beast, as Jose Marti did, must understand, as he did, its insides. And thank you very much. <laughs> now we will have questions. Yes, Ron. Um, I guess I'd like to understand better your feelings about Barack Obama. My sense was that if he had his way, he would push through an opening that would be fairly consistent with what a majority of Cuban people want, and maybe even Raul, within limits, would want also. But I, I, I was sensing that you didn't feel that way about Barack Obama. Um, so I guess I was just looking for uh, something more about his motivations and your feelings about what he did uh, Jan uh, December 17th. Okay, so Ron Howell, who's a very good journalist, asked Jane to 
explain in a little more depth her feelings about Barack Obama's attitude toward the change and the depth of his feelings one way or the other about the new opening. Based on what I was saying about why he did it, before the election in 2008, Barack Obama at a speech in Miami to the same Cuban American National Foundation group fundraising event, big fundraising, that um, he was going to improve travel between the United States uh, residents and Cuba, Cuban Americans in the United States, not the rest of us, but Cuban Americans, and also allow remittances, which Bush had, President Bush had limited incredibly. Uh, so he was going to do that because the Cuban American National Van Foundation wanted that too. Most Cuban Americans in Miami wanted that. Uh, but he said then that he would leave the embargo in place. Now, as President of the United States, he has to know a certain amount of history. And I would be surprised if he doesn't know about the origin of the trade embargo that I read about that uh, it is based on the desire to starve the Cuban people into submission. That's the basis of the trade embargo. But he said that would remain in place. By 2015, many years later, and many talks with various people later, he had decided the embargo was not working well enough and it never had worked well enough. And so he would uh, urge Congress to get rid of it. But that's a very practical decision. I think it's a very good decision. You know, obviously we should get rid of that embargo. And when he made the surprise announcement uh, in um, December, I mean, uh, yeah, December 17, 2014, everybody was pleased because this was something that should have happened not in 2014, but in 1959, right after the revolution. He could have worked with Cuba then. Things would have been entirely, or the president could have, Eisenhower could have. The situation would be entirely different. They would have had a friendly relationship, and obviously a relationship of capitalism, capitalism and imperialism, meaning to more or less uh, subsume the economy of the country but at least it would have been a relationship of friendship if the Washington had chosen to make it that. They didn't. So Obama's making it that in 2014 is a good thing, absolutely. Why he did it, though, it was a practical decision because he really was up against the wall in the Organization of American States. And they care a great deal about the Organization of American States. They want it to continue. They want it to to be there rather than the Latin American and Caribbean community, CELAC. Uh, they don't want CELAC in control of things. That's very clear from what they're doing now. Um, they don't, and obviously CELAC has shut out the United States and Canada. That's a very deliberate policy. So, you know, and the OAS hasn't because it's based in Washington. The OAS is, is a Washington based organization that suits Washington, that suits President Obama and all the presidents before him. So I view it as uh, a good thing because it puts it, as I said in the paper, on the table, puts negotiations out there, everybody's talking. That is a challenge for everybody. It's a good challenge. We'll see what comes of that. And Cuba has to make decisions. Uh, to acclimate to this new relationship. The United States should make decisions to acclimate to this new relationship. Uh, they should get out of Guantanamo. They should um, end the embargo. You know, We'll see whether this country is capable of making such important steps. Well, I think there's also the, the problem that you know, any of these, of these kinds of decisions are based on pragmatics by most politicians, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton, who was in large part
part helpful and perhaps even responsible through her family for making sure that when Bill Clinton ran for president the first time um, that the embargo would remain in place and as we know I mean he pushed through the Helms-Burton bill that made the embargo even tougher um, and then suddenly Hillary writes her book when she leaves the position of Secretary of State and buried somewhere in the book is the suggestion that she told Obama that he must improve relations with Cuba if he wanted to have good relations with Latin America. Well, it's there the first we knew of it, right? She had never made a declaration okay. to that. She had never told us that she was telling Obama that. Um, yeah. But when she left the position and her book was published and Cuba came to the fore, she then said, well, you know, I told him <laughs> that, that if he wanted good relations with Latin America, um, he should improve relations with Cuba because otherwise Latin American countries were not go going to go along with us. That's right? right. And when he went to Argentina just now, he used this. Um, and, you know, they had just been very happy that uh, Cristina Kirchner was out and Mauricio Macri is in. And so he goes down to Argentina following a celebration of his uh, wonderful policy, which it is a wonderful policy, in Havana. He goes down to uh, Argentina and even tangos, you know, with the woman. Um, and, and he's happy as a lark down there because he can use his friendship with Cuba to show the Argentinian people that they shouldn't think too much about that they should not uh, pay, pay too much attention to that past history of the dirty war. And he even promised to release some of those documents that he hasn't yet released. And I haven't seen anything about them being released either yet, but I'm sure they're working hard to try to redact enough information that it won't destroy everybody's faith in the United States of America and Latin America. So, you know, yeah. You said the embargo uh, was intended uh, the diplomatic uh, cutoff and the embargo were intended to bring about regime change and also economic, uh, you know, bring uh, Cubans to their knees. It hasn't done that, uh, but what it has done is it has made the Cubans very vulnerable and economically needy. And that's not a good negotiating uh, point to be in. So I want you to reflect on that. And, and see what that means going forward because it has made them, it has hurt them up tremendously. I see the United States trying to capitalize on that, on that neediness uh, for trade, for economics. And so going forward, kind of switch gears, look at it from the Cuban perspective. You are the average Cuban who has needs and who has to deal with this. Uh, how do you see this impacting the relationship going forward? You're saying that the Cuban people are in a very vulnerable state right now yes. and largely because of the economic situation. Yes. Many people just, you know, when I was there in the last three weeks, were talking about the fact that food prices have started to skyrocket mm -hmm. because so much of the food and the limited supply of food has started to go into the tourist industry, largely because of the enormous number of us who are rushing down there because now that the travel ban has been uh, not lifted, but certainly it's easier to travel there, you can already see some of those vulnerabilities coming to the fore. Well, this is the challenge. That will depend on what Cuba is able to do to improve the economy at the same time that the United States is still waging economic warfare against Cuba. I mean, when you have a French company fined for using materials that had an origin of, of some material in the equipment was uh, originated in the United States, that is a major international intercession um, with Cuban rights to trade with whom they want and to have French vessels working in their territorial waters and so on. This is constant going on. So 
uh, that's, a, that's a challenge that the United States could stop. They're not stopping it. They're continuing it. And so until the United <coughs> States shows Cuba that it's really serious about sovereign equality, uh, then the Cubans have to be wary. And that leads to more of what you're discussing, what you're worried about, the, the vulnerability of Cuba's economy, the vulnerability of, of people uh, dealing with this situation. It's a, it's a serious thing. There's no easy answer. Absolutely no easy answer. I think there's a lot also about the embargo that most people in the United States really don't understand, you know, because so many people say to us here at the center, but I don't understand. They have relations with every other country in the world. Why can't they get A, B, C, and X, Y, and Z that they need from those countries? And when I point out to them that we do damage to other countries because they trade with Cuba, that if any product is made in England, say, or France, or Germany, with the tiniest percentage of Cuban nickel, that product cannot be exported to the United States. Not to mention the fact that the worst of all, of course, that the CEOs and their families cannot travel here for their vacation. <laughs> That's really the worst. You know? But that shows how, how, how far we would go, the stupidity. But I think a lot of people simply don't realize that we, we do things to other countries. We have a lot of power. I remember many years ago, remember when Brazilian Airlines said that they wanted to invest in Cubana Airlines. And you know, Cuba has a rule generally for foreign investments that no foreign investor can invest more than 49% that 51% remains with the Cuban government or the Cuban entity. But in the case of the Brazilian airlines wanting to invest in Cubana, they were willing to give Brazil 51%. And immediately we went nuts. You know, we basically said to Brazil, you invest in Cubana and all aid to Brazil is cut off. So of course that was the end of, of Brazilian airlines investing in Cubana. I mean, we, we have a lot of clout. Yeah. Also, back when these things were happening, when there were lots of moves uh, toward uh, airlines relating to Cuban travel and so on, that's when the right-wing Cuban bombers went into full gear. And the mid-70s, when um, Carter was trying to improve things later, and bombs went off at airports regularly, you know, in, in suitcases on the way to planes and so on. And, and so there was this tremendous surge of um, sabotage of airlines and also assassinations of Cubans who were trying to work with Cuba and so on in this country. So, so you had the, the terrorism that worked. With the trade embargo and the and the travel ban being lifted, what are your suggestions for how Cuba does not become Miami in 20 years? She's asking um, if the ban is lifted, how do you prevent Cuba from becoming Miami? <laughs> <laughs> That's the key question. Because people, young people in particular, want goods. They want what is in the supermarkets in, in Miami, you know. They, they, they want, America is very hot, you know. It's, it's the Rolling Stones get, how many people, 500,000 people out to hear them and... and uh, they're not Americans, they're Brits. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, they're Brits. <laughs> it's a question that the Cuban people will have to deal with. I don't know. I have no predictions about what's going to happen with that. It's a very difficult question. Can I say something to that? Sure. I think Cuban culture and Cuban people are stronger than we think. I do not think Havana is going to become Miami because the fact is that, let's look at it most pragmatically, the Cubans know 
that we want to go there because they're Cuba. Otherwise, we would just go to Miami. You know? So I think that a lot of Cubans are very concerned that Havana doesn't become Miami. One thing is goods. You know, I think they'd probably rather have New York supermarkets than Miami supermarkets, frankly. But whatever they get in goods cannot possibly be equal to what they have in goods. They have their culture, they have their architecture, they have their music, they have their art, they have their streets. They're not paved with gold. They're not even paved sometime. <laughs> but they're paved with marvelous people and with people who are smart and well-educated and healthy and know that what they've got going for them is themselves. They're not, you know, if they want Miami, they'll go to Miami. They're not going to turn their own country into Miami. Cuban culture is very strong. Cubans are very, very much aware of what a U.S. tsunami can mean because it's already starting to happen. And they're already starting to push back. Always worry about what is going to happen to Cuba. Is it going to change? But we don't think we don't. I think that we're going to have a problem too because when people are going to see that Cuba can offer free education, free health care, a lot of the services that we can't even get, then the American government's going to have to right, right. face that because it's one thing to know that they have all those things. But when you're actually able to go there and travel and see it for yourself, then you, you know, it hits you and you say, oh wow, I can't even get that. Mm -hmm. So I think at the same time, we worry about them, us influencing them, but they're gonna you know, also bring a lot of social positive changes to us that the government is gonna have to do for us because of that, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. In the back? Well, that was a good point I was going to make that also. I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the U.S. policymakers ought to be at least as worried about how Cuba and Cuban ideas uh, of solidarity and all the things that we know are going to influence things politics in the United States as, as the other way around. I think we should take that into, into consideration as people go to Cuba they see things like the example of Cuban doctors in Africa, things that they are ignorant of, and the idea of a, of a quote, poor country that's able to provide world-class education, health care, many other things. That influence is going to, it's the battle of ideas, as Fidel said. But I also wanted to say also, uh, to take this opportunity, as those of us that are active in the, in the Cuba Solidarity Movement, to thank Jane and her great example over the years. I know that, I know that every time those of us that have been struggling, as almost everybody in this room, whenever we were organizing a demonstration or an event, we could always count on Jane uh, to be there in, in body or soul or whatever uh, to, to be part of a struggle. And uh, so we, we thank that. One other thing I just wanted to say is that it's also important to, to understand that the U.S. policy, which Obama was able to admit, you know, uh, was unsustainable. It had gotten to the point, I mean, it's a retreat. There's no question that, that it's a retreat. But, you know, retreats are not, I mean, we should try to turn the retreat into a rout. But people a lot of times retreat so that they can regather their forces and regain the offensive because they haven't actually changed the policy. They're still trying to overthrow the Cuban Revolution. They're still trying to subvert it. All these things are still happening, but Obama was uh, uh, smart enough and savvy enough to understand that you can't continue that policy with the same methods that it was the price was becoming too much politically. I mean, it got to the point, you alluded to the United Nations votes. I always go to those votes and sit and watch it, and it's just an amazing spectacle. 
They couldn't even get their puppet governments that they installed in Iraq and Afghanistan to vote for the policy. I mean, that's how bad it was. So, I mean, you know, this was something that was just unsustainable politically. So Obama was smart enough, and I think most of the ruling class uh, in this country agreed with him, you know, that they had to step back to try to re reconnoiter, so to speak, and, and regain the offensive at some future time. Yeah, yeah well, in fact, I mean, in, in the UN, 191 countries out of 193 have voted to end the embargo. For years and years and years, there's been this, not, since 1992, there's been this majority uh, that get, kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and finally got to everybody except for Israel and the United States uh, in 2015. So internationally, Cuba is not isolated. So uh, that, that is a big help, and it's very positive. People in the United States have bought hook, line, and sinker different administrations saying that Cuba is isolated. We know it's not. Right. Just to point on Miami, you know, I think that people in Cuba are aware of Miami, the good and the bad, the unemployment rate. Even the people who control the airport in Miami, which are Cuban-Americans, are not even getting minimum wage. Then there's a control of the underground economy and the mafia and the business contradictions they have with payoffs. You know, and it's just reminiscent of the recent migration to Orlando, Florida of Puerto Ricans. For the first time in Orlando, they're registering growing homelessness among Puerto Ricans arri arriving from the island. Mm -hmm. The other thing, and it's up to us also to educate people when we go to Cuba about some of the realities that we face in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was there twice during the special period, both times. And for those of us who've been there, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have, the resiliency of the Cuban people is incredible. It's just incredible that they were able to overcome a period where over 80%, as many of you already know, of the economy went down when the Soviet Union went down. So there's a lot, like Sandy said, in the culture, in the experience, and they know their history. That's something people in this country don't know. They are taught their history in school. About five years ago, I was watching Channel 13, and there was an interview with the Cuban kids in Miami. And a lot of them said, you know, that's my parents and my grandparents stick, this whole anti-Cuba thing. I really want to know what it's like because I know my people come from Cuba. You know, so the thing is to be on our guard because I remember I was driving with Adames to a Cuba meeting and I heard this lady on BAI <laughs> saying, what are the Cubans going to do when the ATMs are running all over Havana, wild? And I got angry because I said, this is BAI, and if we have movement people that don't realize that Cuba has been doing the joint ventures, the Germans, the Italians, or like you said, even the, the Israelis have been doing business with Cuba, then we have a lot of education to do in our own movement about what's going on. Uh, that the when when uh, Obama went to Havana and said in that speech that um, Miami should be the model, uh, the reaction was definitely not what he had expected and um, in fact when I read that I didn't hear it I read it afterwards I was shocked at how insensitive it was of Obama to mention of, of Miami in that way because Miami was the center and is still the center of corruption uh, targeting Cuba yes. and the, the mafia you know the whole yeah. Cuban mafia so uh, I think that backfired. It was kind of a rare slip. It was a real yes, it slip. Was, was a rare Marie, we wanted to make sure that you carried a little something from Cuba to 
the Bay Area. All right. <laughs> and so we have a couple of little things to give you. And one is, you remember this poster, oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I remember when I interviewed Rosegard for an article I was doing about this design. And I said, you know, what does it really mean to you? Why did you do that? And he said, because it's about the beauty and the pain of building a revolution. And that's why it's a beautiful rose with a thorn and a drop of blood. Wow. And it sort of says it all. <laughs> and then yes, we also wanted to give you a little piece of art. Oh, it's all wrapped up. Bernardo, why did you wrap it up? How can, how can she see it? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> After you wrapped it so carefully. You know. <laughs> well, this is... Um, th this is by Alfredo Sosa Bravo, who won who's one of Cuba's oh. most well-known artists. And this was a special limited edition mosaic that he had done in the Isle of Pines. Oh, wow. um, and so thank we you. think That's it'll look beautiful. nice wherever you decide to hang it yes. in your new home. Yes, well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> You have to come see me then. Yes, I will come and see you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think um, that I will let us, unless there's any very, very important question or comment, I think I would leave the last half hour of our time so that you can talk to Jane individually, buy the book, and have her sign it for you. <laughs> to be backed up by this poster of Huron and USA fading away. <laughs> okay. Yeah, USA upside down, inside out. <laughs> okay. You want me to put that on? <laughs> okay. How's that? <laughs> Okay, I'll wear it later. Uh, 2nd of December. Ah, so that's when the grandma landed. The beginning of the revolution. Oh, right, right. Yes, a woman who uh, a visual artist that I hadn't met, she was asked to do the backdrop for Romeo and Juliet. It's nice to you. You're all okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Your last name on her list. I'm a Negro. 